Hello and welcome back. We are in the last module, module 8. And in this module, we are looking at the recent uh, developments in bilingualism research. Uh, from module 1 to 7, we have discussed the various background mechanisms as well as empirical uh, studies that look at the various processes in terms of bilingual population, in terms of various uh, factors responsible for the differences in terms of bilingual language processing. So, at the end of it, now we, we are um, looking at where the field is going as in what is the future of this field. So, in terms of that we have already discussed a few issues. Today we will start with a new model that has been uh, proposed in terms of bilingual language processing, not only bilingual language processing, multiple language processing. Now, if you recall in terms of bilingual language processing, there were a lot of disparity or let us say a lot of uh, different results that are available in the literature in terms of whether the bilingual advantage holds or it does not hold, what are the differences uh, in terms of different populations and so on. And then we also saw that uh, from that kind of divergent outcome, now we have come to the uh, situation where researchers are proposing different variables to be taken into account. So, one of that is that bilingual population cannot be understood as a homogeneous group. So, there are many new, new um, uh, variables, new, new uh, ways of looking at the bilingual processing that has come into the forefront now. In that vein, we will today discuss the new model that has tried to uh, make sense. So, now because of all of these uh, divergent results, now the researchers have started looking at bilingualism taking into account a lot of other factors which may not be necessarily part of the psycholinguistics of bilingualism let us say. So, when you talk about cognitive and psycholinguistic aspect of bilingualism, there are many things that are probably being uh, going unnoticed that is what the uh, current finding current uh, feeling is. So, in, in that way different aspects of bilingualism like uh, contact linguistics, heritage linguistics, cross linguistic influence studies, translation, sociolinguistic typology these are some other areas that have now um, been proposed as you know um, uh, as ally. So, when we, look, when we are looking at bilingual language processing, we should not and uh, we probably cannot anymore ignore these subdomains of uh, language studies where these the other factors are also taken into account. So, another thing about this in the background of this model is that the, it has been pointed out quite often now that bilingualism is not a static phenomenon, it is a fluid phenomenon. In because a bilingual language A and B may not be the same person as the bilingual in uh, C and D languages. That said, even within the same A and B bilingualism, there are a number of variables, a number of uh, contributing factors that make it a fluid mechanism. Even within the same bilingual person, the status of bilingualism in terms of the in, uh, mutual interference of the two languages can also change. So, it is fluid in all these three different or probably there are more ways of differences that we can think of. So, bilingualism not only changes across lifespan, but also some of these studies uh, typically bilingualism in action, in the studies that are uh, together called bilingualism in action, they show that a bilingual's linguistic behavior can change from one moment to another as well as go through long term changes. So, you get the feel that it is a very very complex phenomenon to look at and hence we need an overarching sort of a model that takes care of all of these possibilities and may tries to make sense of the uh, processing the results that are coming out. And also it should be able to provide enough explanatory power for the same process. So, that is the idea and keeping this, um, this in the background complex adaptive system principle or CASP in short was proposed by Pilipovich and Hawkins in uh, 2018. This was built up on their previous model by the same name which they proposed in 2013 on second language acquisition. So, this is an updated version of the same and this tries to make sense of the bilingual linguistic behavior in various um, by giving an overarching set of principles. So, what are those principles? So, before we go to the principles, the underlying logic that Filipovich uh, has explained in his uh, in her book is that um, 
I mean, the biggest challenge for any overall model is that there are so many factors at play at any given point of time and many of them may not be always uh, psycholinguistic uh, properties also. So, power status for example, frequency of use and so on and so forth. So, it is very difficult to capture all of that, but this is what they have tried to do. So, there are a few um, principles, general principles as they call, one of them is called minimizing learning effort, then minimizing processing effort, maximizing expressive power, maximizing uh, efficiency in communication and doing all of that by, by maximizing common ground. These are the five principles that uh, they have proposed. So, minimizing the effort to learn and process while maximizing the output. So, basically optimizing the, uh, the entire input and output system. So, how does this work? The most efficient way for bilinguals as per Pilipovich is to deal with two linguistic systems at the same time. Now, when we deal with two linguistic system, this automatically adds to the cognitive load. Now, as a result of which they have to uh, take care of added cognitive load with the similar kind of and the shared resources. Resources are the sh are shared, the human brain remains the same, the same person, but the same brain has to take care of two different uh, systems. So, as a result of which the structures and, and meanings that are shared between the two languages can become connected in the bilingual mind. This is as per the proposal of the model. So, when there are meanings and uh, structures which are similar, meaning the languages that are closer, in that case what happens that the, the systems get connected in the mind, they get more reinforced and more readily accessible in both the languages. This is why, this is how they explain the findings uh, where you see differences between languages which are uh, close as opposed to languages which are genetically distant. Similarly, if a specific form exists only in one language but not in the other, what happens then? So, the most straightforward way to maximize common ground in that case would be to transfer the property of one language into the other. So, this is how the model uh, tries to make sense of the divergent results. We will not get into the details of this, references are there in the, uh, at the end where you can look up. Similarly, uh, another domain that has become quite popular now and in fact, this is uh, emerging as an alternative to the traditional teaching learning method of second language or third language or any new language for that matter is the cognitive approach to language teaching and learning. So, in uh, if you recall when we discussed uh, second language learning, we, dis we, we saw that there are lots of um, proposals and depending on the goal of the language teaching uh, paradigm and at a given point of time, the strategies of teaching have also been experimented with. So, there have been various kinds of experiment, various kinds of um, teaching methods that have been used for taking care of various kinds of uh, needs in terms of second language acquisition. So, the various, uh, so that, that brings to the forefront that idea that they, this has not been a very uh, smooth sailing sort of a thing in this domain because there have been lots and lots of discussions, disagreements as to what should be taught and how should it be taught and whether we should teach grammar at all. If we, te we should teach grammar, can we teach language without teaching grammar on the one hand? On the other hand, is grammar teaching enough to teach a language? So, these are some of the major questions that have been asked in this domain as, uh, with respect to the teaching strategies. So, in a, in a uh, recent literature review um, in, for applied linguistics by Anton in 2011, they pointed out that traditional approaches uh, for language teaching, typically grammar teaching, often does not uh, take care of the communicative needs of the um, participants, of the, of the students. So, on the one hand you need to learn grammar, on the other hand on one's communicative competence is also of utmost importance. You will um, easily, you can see this in the in real life when you have learned a language through grammar book, how, uh, how, um, uh, what are the difficulties that you face when you are going into the real life scenario. As a result of which nowadays uh, real life conversations and so on are incorporated. So, a balance between the formal study of grammar as well as the uh, processes near the, that are important for meaningful conversation in real life situations is a necessity. So, keeping this kind of a um, uh, necessity in mind, 
Another new way of uh, teaching language has been proposed which is the cognitive linguistic theory of language teaching. Now, this is not entirely new as because we are talking about the recent trends, this is not a very recently uh, developed uh, trend, this has been doing the rounds since quite some time now, uh, it has been two decades. However, every uh, uh, few, uh, every now and then we have some new developments coming in. So, basically what um, the earlier uh, authors uh, Darwin and others they proposed is that cognitive linguistics inspired learning materials can be useful for learners from beginner to the uh, advanced level learners. Typically what happens why we are mentioning this is depending on the, the level of learner as in we, if somebody is a beginner versus somebody is a mid level learner versus somebody who is an advanced learner, typically the teaching material differs. Teaching material, the um, strategy of delivering the content and so on and the uh, assessment uh, strategies all of that differ. But uh, using cognitive linguistic framework as a scaffold if you use that for language learn uh, teaching purposes, it is useful for all, uh, all the different levels of learners. So, that is one of the uh, positive sides of this particular uh, framework. So, it is because the inst interesting thing about this uh, paradigm is that here grammar pairs meaning and form as one teachable unit. Basically, in the, in the cognitive linguistic uh, framework, the learners are not uh, taught only the grammatical forms or that is the form or, uh, or the meaning which is the content, but also the entire conceptualization pattern that underlies that form meaning mapping. This is the most important um, uh, point of departure in case of cognitive linguistic framework. So, basically what it does is this framework provides learners with operative principles. What is operative principle? In terms of cognitive linguistics, um, operative principles are the fundamental conceptualization processes that underlie the language linguistic forms and their meaning. So, what you have in one language is not the end of it. What we see, what is the surface form is what typically gets taught in the uh, in, in any kind of teaching learning environment. But cognitive linguistics takes a step backward and looks at the operating principles, looks at the underlying conceptualization pattern that uh, gets reflected in the structure and meaning uh, mapping. So, how do they do that? These are the few principles through which language is looked at. So, you have embodiment of embodiment principle of language, semantic network, construal, prototype, image schema and so on, metaphor. So, you explaining a lang linguistic particular linguistic structure through these principles makes it far more palatable to the learners and they can easily make connections between their own language and then it is easy for them to make the uh, bridge um, from L1 to L2. So, this is why it is considered a very useful um, uh, tool to teach language with. So, it enables them to control their performance uh, uh, rather than having sheer memorization. Often we are used to um, giving grammatical rules to memorize, but cognitive linguistics just uh, sidesteps all of that and looks at the ideas that are behind that. So, this is <clears throat> one important domain that is um, getting a lot of attention these days. In fact, um, uh, there are also research going on in terms of using uh, these frameworks using uh, for example, image schema or uh, embodiment theory or the conceptual metaphor theory to teach language um, in a second language or third language in the digital domain as well digital domain where you can teach yourself, uh, it can be unsupervised learning as well. So, there are these possibilities that are now coming up uh, in a in a interesting way. Another area of uh, current uh, basic research is that of first language attrition. Attrition means when you have when the speakers you know, when they learn a second language chances are very often not if not always that the first language gets lost or let us say the uh, loyalty shifts. So, one uh, depending on the language uh, dominance, which language is dominant and how the demands on the language users are, sometimes chances are that first language attrition will be visible. So, as a result of an automatic outcome of bilingualism research, first language attrition is also uh, being looked at. Uh, most importantly among immigrants with a uh, lot of mass migration across continents nowadays, this has become much more uh, visible. So, immigrants that travel to countries where a foreign language is used as the most dominant language, first language very often gets sidelined. 
Similarly, once we have looked at bilingualism and uh, know a lot of uh, research has already taken place, now the natural next step is to look at third language acquisition. So, the most interesting question that is being asked today is, is L3 different, qualitatively different from L2? So, traditionally L3 uh, acquisition, third language acquisition was sort of bracketed with the second language acquisition, kind of considering that first language is different from the second language, but second and third languages may not be very different from each other. Because of obviously, because first language is learnt within the critical period, second language may or may not be learnt within the critical period. So, there are qualitative differences that is already established. So, third language could also be clubbed. However, it's uh, of late, the later researchers have started looking at L3 acquisition as a separate discipline. It is now emerging, but it is um, in its infancy. So, there are various definitions as to what is an L3. So, the acquisition of a non-native language by learners who have already acquired or acquiring two languages. So, two languages are already uh, in place and then the language that you learn, this is will, this will be called third language acquisition. There are many other terms also utilized, multiple language acquisition, multiple acquisition so on. And many, so many other definitions are also available. But that is not uh, the main problem. The main issues that uh, the trilingualism or third language acquisition are looking at is the are various aspects within that. So, looking at finer aspects within trilingualism, within uh, third language acquisition, uh, taking care of uh, cultural and linguistic boundaries and various other domains are also being looked at now. So, these are some of the uh, areas um, based on um, conditions and the setting in which they acquired third language. Hoffman has given five different types of sub uh, areas within trilingualism study. So, the main themes within L3 acquisition has uh, changed over a period of time. In the initial stages, the studies primarily focused on sociolinguistic and educational aspects, but um, uh, and while doing that a lot of focus was on transfer. This is something we, ha we have seen also in L2 acquisition, the transfer from L1 to L2 or L2 to L1 and so on, same kind of focus has been there in L3 also. However, a very important uh, change started happening around 2015. So, post 2015 we see a new um, domain um, in this area which is L3 phonology. So, L3 phonology has emerged as another domain of research within this. However, there are still the work still is uh, in its infancy, it is still a new discipline. So, research on cognitive and psycholinguistic aspects are still not uh, that prevalent or uh, it has not uh, yet become uh, at par with bilingualism studies. So, but it is uh, going there. And then once you have taken care of bilingualism, trilingualism, now the natural next step will be multilingualism. So, not only that, a lot of uh, transnational interactions have become the norm of the times now. The times we are living in, uh, transnational and interactions are very, very common as a result of which multilingualism seen is seen now even in the traditional monolingual countries now as a breathable, a breathing, living and uh, ever evolving phenomenon. So, uh, we have already seen that the last couple of decades bilingualism and multilingualism studies have taken a decidedly cognitive and psycholinguistic turn. However, the social uh, ecological forces uh, have often been uh, ignored, which we have already discussed in terms of bilingualism and the same is there for multilingualism as well. So, uh, primarily theoretical and empirical uh, efforts to characterize psycholinguistic processes the social view gets ignored. So, that is where again in this, this case also there is, there is a lot of discussion going on as to how and uh, in which way we can incorporate the social aspect of biling multilingualism into the psycholinguistics of it. So, there are many researchers who are now giving a call for interdisciplinary uh, studies looking at multilingualism from as diverse uh, areas as possible. So, in, uh, in terms of diversity, we, have, we are looking at historical forces leading to multilingualism, then the kind of uh, social goals which brought the communities together. Sometimes the social goals could be uh, mutual 
Sometimes it could be one-sided. One-sided social goals are typically the hallmark of colonization. Uh, but today, it is there are a lot of uh, mutually mutual goals are there when uh, transnational companies are coming up, lots of intercontinental uh, intercontinental cooperation and so on. So that is another factor. Similarly, the how language systems evolve over time and how they are essentially culture bound. This is another domain that has been pointed out that we are not looking at or we are not taking seriously enough. And then so socio-cultural forces that uh, either force uh, participants, uh, people to be multilingual or sometimes they do it by you know voluntarily. So, all of these factors are very important factors and that should be taken into account. So, in a nutshell what the, the gist of the matter is that uh, the researchers are calling for incorporating neurocognitive expertise on the one hand and sociolinguistic and socio-cultural context to come together. So, not only we should of course, we should we must look at the neurocognitive mechanism but at the same time. Uh, the sociolinguistic and sociocultural theories should be also accounted for. So, basically the, this, the, there is a name given for it, this is called systems framework, um, socially situated systems framework uh, which is the proposed framework. This is uh, one area. Another is the also translanguaging, heteroglossic language ideologies etc. are also emerging areas within multilingualism studies. Multilingualism has become a very important factor in education also. Multilingual education has become a very common factor across the world again due to the same kind of uh, motivating factors whether it is uh, large level migration or lots of uh, intercontinental, intercultural, inter uh, country cooperation in terms of trade and commerce and so on. So, education, multilingualism uh, in terms of education is also an important factor. So, this po not only poses a challenge, but also as an opportunity for all kinds of education system. Challenge because when you have a diverse uh, classroom uh, where, where students represent different languages, how what exactly should be the ideal method of teaching that group is uh, of course, certainly a very big challenge. But at the same time, this might also po uh, prove to be an opportunity. So, it is again emerging as a very uh, interesting area of research not only within linguistics but across but also in terms of uh, uh, other domains. So, in order to meet the challenges and draw on the opportunities of ling uh, linguistically diverse societies is um, what the research is now looking at. So, some European countries which uh, uh, we will discuss now, so how they have tackled with this. So, in case of Germany for example, that this has the third, is, uh, third largest number of international migrants in the world and you there is a the, the variety is very interesting. So, you have Turkish, Russian, Polish and Portuguese um, migrants into the country and as a result the classroom scenario is very um, quite diverse and that um, automatically uh, is visible in terms of inequality in educational achievement between students. So, auto already it becomes a complex scenario, migration could be collect connected to or diversity in the classroom could be connected to different outcomes, different outcomes in terms of achievement in education or um, but this could be uh, due to migration but non-migrant population also. So, there have been many studies looking at all these variables uh, within this scenario. So, research in this domain typically have focused on German as the language of um, uh, schooling. So, if German is the language of schooling, how does it affect the various uh, linguistic groups that are there, the diverse groups that are represented in the classroom. So, that is the German case. Moving on to Italy, the um, Italy also has a large number of uh, immigrant populations, so Romanian, Arabic and Spanish speaking um, uh, people are there. So, in that case also here. Other than Italian and its dialects, four other regional languages are also there, uh, which are official languages. So, you see how the, the scenario is quite uh, diverse and essentially multilingual. So, in that case, uh, as a result of all this kind of a background, Italian, uh, the, the research from Italy also is focusing a lot on multilingual education. Similarly, for Netherlands, because it has 25 percent of the population has migrant background. Portugal again similar kind of scenario, Spain. So, many of these European countries have now um, taken up multilingual education, multilingualism in a big way to understand how these different factors um, have an impact on the educational outcome as well as linguistic outcome. 
moving beyond languages um, languages as we have seen in throughout this course doesn't remain the impact of language or uh, of speaking one or two languages doesn't remain uh, confined to language alone it also affects many other uh, domains of mental behavior so one of them is today uh, today is the age of apps so uh, the virtual learning is a very common thing these days a lot of uh, uh, virtual learning platforms are there for children teaching math science and so on so this has uh, this has emerged again as another interesting domain of research as to how uh, if there are connections between bilingual education and education through apps and so on so this is one such uh, study that we will discuss uh, in one such study children who were uh, quite young 5 to 6 years they are attending uh, bilingual immersion schools and they were also given apps to learn mathematics so they on the one hand they had traditional uh, teaching going on on the other hand they were also given apps to study mathematics and learn from them so there are two interesting uh, outcomes of this research that has been reported the results showed that children learned better through app as compared to the standard teaching practice okay there might be multiple reasons for it one of them is uh, the the content remains standardized as opposed to you know uh, classroom teaching or standard teaching practices may be open to varieties depending on the teacher and teachers um, qualification attitude and so on but in case of app that doesn't happen the content and the content delivery mechanism remain the same and there are many others so the finding is that through app the children were learning mathematics much better as opposed to in the classroom and uh, another interesting thing is that they did better whether the the language of the app was l1 or l2 the app was the delivered the content uh, both in the l1 and in the l2 so what they found out was the performance the learning now was better in app based learning whether it is in l1 or it is in l2 so that is one and proficiency of the language in the language so how proficient one is in the l1 or l2 had a correlation with the outcome so if you are uh, better higher proficient your outcome will be better so studies like this basically brings out the possibilities of new grounds of research linking bilingual educational theories to educational apps in fact as i just said educational apps and social robots and so on are now a big uh, area of research and we are trying uh, researchers are trying to come out with come up with uh, the best in the domain so in that when while doing that we need this kind of research that is going on so findings can be extended to different settings like control learning real world learning and bilingual immersion setting and so on so this is another area so these were the areas of current uh, basic research now in the application oriented research also we see some interesting trends when we talk about the latest uh, areas of interesting uh, research so research for the sake of research is a good idea which is what we call basic research but uh, having an applied domain is um, much better i mean if you have if your uh, research has an application in the real world nothing like it so in keeping that in mind a few areas of practical application uh, in uh, where uh, cognitive and psycholinguistic knowledge of bilingualism can be used so there are of course many other domains but as we are focused in cogn on cognitive and psycholinguistic aspect of bilingualism we are uh, will look at some of these of course this is not an exhaustive list but these are some of the domains that are um, that that are now you know, throwing up interesting research output one of them is language teaching as we have just seen uh, and translation translation studies have been popular for uh, a long time translation studies are relevant in case of literature in case of linguistics and as well as social um, understanding of language use and so on so this is also getting influenced by the findings in bilingualism research intercultural communication we have discussed some of it in the beginning of the course this is also another domain where the understanding of language and cognition interfaces in various cases are, are now informing the results uh, informing the newer, newer research and then last but not the least marketing but as i just said this is not an exhaustive list this is just a pointer uh, as to how things are changing so um a language language uh, teaching in case of language teaching one interesting um, 
combination has been linguistic relativity and language teaching uh, uh, looking at them together. So, the impact of understanding linguistic relativity, impact of uh, research in linguistic relativity and if that can have a uh, that can be utilized if that knowledge can be utilized in terms of language teaching. So, that is the idea. So, in the pre Chomskyan area there was a belief that languages can differ from each other without limit and in unpredictable ways. So, this was way back in 1957, uh, the idea was given out that languages are different, of course they are different, but they can be, uh, the differences can be without limit and unpredictable. So, if cognition also varies similarly uncontrollably, then teaching language becomes very difficult. So, languages are different, cognition is also very different and if the differences are as you know similar between them that is uh, uncontrollable and without limit then you can very easily imagine how difficult it will be to teach a language uh, a second language to somebody who for, for whom these two languages are very different because the cognition the fundamental understanding itself will be different because learning another language would mean learning a whole new set of concepts this was pre Chomskyan uh, understanding because languages are different and concepts are also different, cognition is also different. So, for example, there have been a lot of studies in, in this line, some of it we have discussed in the uh, language learning second language acquisition uh, module. So, for example, a structure like this, I have been to the USA versus I went to the USA, this kind of structural differences is not very easy to uh, teach. In, in a, to somebody who does not have that, a, a person whose first language does not have this kind of differences. This was pre Chomsky. So, post Chomsky and after Chomsky the propagation of the idea of a strict separation between language and intentional conceptual system. If I can refresh your memory a bit, Chomsky's ideas are um, and then of course after Chomsky, Fodor and many others, they supported the idea of modularity, modularity of the human mind. What does modularity of the human mind talk about? The brain is human mind is uh, made of modules, different, uh, different modular settings are there for each purpose. So, language is one such module and because it is separate from other modules, it need not interact. So, as a result of which there is a strict separation as Chomsky proposed between language. So, language in Chomskyan terms is a computation system, so symbol manipulation system, right. So, symbol manipulation system it need not depend on the sociological or intentional and conceptual system, they are two different things altogether. So, there is no, they do not talk to each other, this is the idea. So, when you talk about um, this kind of a notion, this means that language teachers can ignore cognition altogether and just focus on language. This is exactly what happened in the post Chomsky uh, area, era when the language teaching language was only for the sake of learning and teaching language and concepts were not given much of an uh, focus because concepts are unvaried. The idea was that concepts across languages or across groups at the, at the fundamental level level they remain unvaried, they remain universal and language also has an universal aspect which is the universal grammar, only the surface structure changes. So, keeping this kind of a background in mind, a lot of language teaching methods have focused primarily on language and as somebody very interestingly put it, a nod in the direction of culture not really taking it as a variable, not really focusing on the uh, cultural aspects or the intentional or the conceptual systems and so forth, primarily focusing on language, its structure, grammar and so on with a nod towards the culture, okay, this also exists sort of thing. On the other hand, if we look at linguistic relativity on the other hand, so if one accepts the speakers of different languages think differently, this is the idea of linguistic relativity. Uh, that uh, different languages because by virtue of the semantic structure difference. So, if you have for example, Hopi is the most famous example in this domain. So, Hopi does not have grammatical uh, tense marker. So, that probably mean means that they do not understand the idea of time as we do. This is where the whole controversy actually started from. So, the I basic idea was that languages are um, the different speakers of different languages think differently. Now, if that is taken as, a, as, as true, then second language need to take into account what those differences are when you are teaching, keeping uh, linguistic relativity as a fundamental backbone, if you start uh, creating a language teaching mechanism, then what are the things to be taken into account? One is to find out where the differences are, 
which of them are teachable not everything can be teachable there are certain things that are that that defy any teaching material and then how to teach them so what are the differences which of them can be taught and how to teach them so for example japanese and english have different ways of categorizing objects okay so japanese um, categorize objects by material and english by shape to give you a small example the there have been many studies in this line so there are uh, we, we did discuss this in bilingual uh, cognition uh, module um, so if there are plastic combs and uh, wooden combs and you know plastic and a dump of wooden blocks and so on and then if you ask the japanese speakers to put similar things together they will put everything wooden together and everything plastic together but if you ask the english speakers they will put combs together whether it is uh, wooden comb or plastic comb and all other things separate so this is what we mean by different ways of categorizing objects now teaching english to japanese uh, learners will have to address this issue and this issue can be taught in terms of cognitive mechanisms and conceptual uh, conceptualization pattern present in each language that is one yet another viewpoint exists that neither language nor cognition is static so neither cognition is just universal and static nor it is you know uh, continuous it is different in, in each, each language but neither language nor cognition is static in to l2 users so many scholars have now argued that concepts are uh, for a bilingual uh, brain we have discussed this in bilingual cognition module that for a bilingual brain what happens is the bilingual a combination of two monolinguals does it mean that he has you know uh, concepts in l1 and concepts in l2 as separate things and how does it really work so in that background some researchers have proposed that bilinguals have something distinct of their own kind of a third place where they blend blend the concepts of l1 and the concepts of l2 and create a very different understanding of the same idea which is different from the l1 speakers l1 monolingual speakers as well as l2 monolingual speakers i would like to draw your attention to the greek by bi english bilingual study that we discussed in terms of the blay and galazzo color categories so this is what we mean by creating a third space so the bilingual learner creates his own unique blend of concept uh, in the on the margins of the official position official position as in the monolingual position on those concepts in each of the languages so in this view the l2 teaching need not force learners to learn how it is in l2 but just to just give the concepts give the language forms and the concept underlying concepts and let them be let them create their own concept so that is another now this is obviously when you are talking about language teaching goals of language teaching is also important uh, so the, the, but then as we all know that language learning learning a new language has enormous possibilities so that is um, that that is actually not a very good uh, question there could be different kinds of uh, reasons from philosophical to more practical but uh, whatever the goal is the fundamental thing still remains fundamental fact still remains that the ideas the encoded in different languages more so when they are different from the l1 need to be taken into account now finding a way to tackle that problem there have been many theories many uh, strategies one we have already discussed just now the cognitive linguistic framework so if we take that into account teaching of l2 can be more fruitful so this is an applied domain where um, a lot of uh, research is going on another area is that of translation now translation again it has been uh, looked at from linguistic relativity theories uh, so uh, humboldt was one of the first to talk about uh, th that language helps determine the speaker's uh, world view weltan shang he called it so the language the, the structure of the language has a role to play uh, in terms of the person's world view so it was conceived as an inner form a structure that corresponds to the speaker's thought process however he did not mean it in a very strict uh, sense he did not really mean it to be deterministic which later on came to be which later on was proposed as a linguistic relativity hypothesis and the stronger version of the hypothesis but uh, humboldt really did not mean it that way so he he called that there is a deep structure of all languages which are same and th and this is the idea that chomsky later on uh, took up from there so language as per humboldt is not a ready made argon which is st static and fixed product but rather a 
Turkish kite or an activity. Basically, this is an activity. So, constantly in uh, in flux. So, it is a flexible system uh, both in terms of incorporating new words and new concepts. So, there is an underlying, there is an, a deep structure at the same time there is the language is a process through which there is a lot of uh, interconnection between the concept and the structure and things can change. So, this idea is a precursor to Jacobson's um, axiom of expressibility and the concomitant law of universal translatability. Right. So, all cognitive experiences and its classification is conveyable in any existing language, meaning that we are going back to where we just uh, discussed that concepts are certain concepts are universal irrespective of the language that you speak and as a result of which every concept is expressible in any language. And later on of course, uh, Worf did not uh, agree and they uh, talked about the relativity and all of that. So, the fundamental thing here to notice is that if the connection between language and thought are strict and they can be different from one language to another, then translation would be impossible. Because the languages are different and concepts are also different, then you cannot translate. There cannot be any equivalent concept from L1 to L2 to translate. So, it is also be very difficult to learn a new language. So, this is uh, impossible if you go by Worfian uh, theory of linguistic relativity, translation also will be difficult. Just as language teaching, a second language teaching will be impossible, nearly impossible, similarly translation will be impossible. So, so when switching from one language, language A to language B, the same person may not understand what he had just said in language A. That is the extent of the problem if we are taking linguistic relativity very strictly. So, um, a lot of new, new theories as a result have come up. One of them is thinking for speaking theory by of Dan Slobin, which says that the difference occurs only before you start to speak. Till then it is difficult, till then there is a lot of universality. So, uh, as a result of which that uh, the languages are different in terms of explicitness rather than fundamental conceptual level. So, languages can the differences that we see are at the level of explicitness and emphasis. So, that is one domain where translation studies are looking at now. Similarly, we have uh, intercultural communication. Intercultural communication uh, we have discussed a bit before that when we talk, when we communicate across language boundaries or across cultural boundaries. So, this has been uh, discussed in terms of second language acquisition studies uh, since quite a long time. So, research on cross-cultural non-verbal communications are also um, have also been around in social psychology um, uh, in the domain of social psychology and has influenced the dominant frame within which we discuss these things today. So, on the one hand bilingual uh, on the one hand second language acquisition on the other hand social psychology both have looked at intercultural communication in their own way. So, but uh, social psychology is more interested in the dynamics of group interaction in terms of distinctiveness, how the differences are, how do the differences emerge in a cross cultural communication. So, how one group differs from another in terms of communicative style for example. Okay. So, while doing so they maintain a difference between intercultural communication and cross cultural communication. So, this distinction is uh, maintained in social psychology. But today these are often used interchangeably. So, in today's terms intercultural communication is a type of communication between participants who share few cultural representations. So, uh, where there is not a lot of uh, similarity, not, of, not a lot of overlap between the cultures, but a few uh, rep cultural representations are shared. So, that is what uh, that is a scenario which merits to be called intercultural communication. So, the degree of similarity of cultural representation as a result of this has been a matter of uh, focus has, has been studied a lot. So, studies have pointed out finer aspects of what and how the differences and similarities might surface and how they might impact the communication intercultural communication. So, that is one area again another applied area in real life, what are the, so how far the cultural uh, boundaries are and in case of an intercultural communication, what gets highlighted? Does the similarity get highlighted? Does the differences get highlighted? And where, what is the role of language there? How far these differences or similarities impact uh, communicative competence and so on. Similarly, uh, intercultural communication and language learning teaching have also been looked at 
in terms of their relationship. One aspect of proposed competence is by stylistic competency that is one uh, new term that has been proposed. So, they refer to the norms of speech in the other language. For example, Canadian bilinguals uh, in immersion program are said to emerge better at sociolinguistic norms in their L2. So, uh, connection between ICC and language learning and teaching. Intercultural effectiveness of communication has also often been considered connected to overall communicative competence. This is understood because until and unless you um, know the differences in or similarities across cultures, communicative competence will be compromised. However, there have been come, there has been a lot of criticisms also. One of them is that it tends to overemphasize the differences and negates the individual agency. This is common in any any study that looks at uh, diversities uh, across cultures and com and uh, languages because um, the differences seem to become very important rather than how the individual person reacts to that particular scenario. So the individual gets uh, sideline in favor of the uh, differences between the between the groups. So uh, needless to say that both the terms culture and communication have also. Um, have been you know taken with a pinch of salt because there are lots of definitional issues as to what uh, should be considered culture and what should be considered uh, an effective communication and but the problem with uh, but uh, uh, problem in the sense that uh, what um, has created more issues with the uh, with understanding in this domain is that less of empirical evidence than rhetorics so a lot of rhetoric is there but very la less of empirical information in the sense of experimental evidence so this this domain is not entirely experimental as a result of which lot of rhetoric makes up for that so that is one problems however this is now getting uh, sort of rectified so there are some studies that are that have come up recently that have taken into account the empirical evidence as well. Other areas uh, that relate to ICC are ethnography and discourse analysis as you can easily expect. So, these are also uh, domains, these are fields that looked at intra versus intercultural differences uh, while being sensitive to the multiple membership of different cultural groups one can have. What that means is that each of us are uh, playing different roles in our day to day uh, life, In a, each of us are uh, playing multiple roles. So, while doing that we are simultaneously part of different groups. So, different um, uh, within the larger group we may be having smaller uh, intra group differences. So, that is what we mean by intra and intercultural differences. So, the within the larger one culture there can be subdivisions and, and one particular individual might be part of many of these subdivisions. So, how do you look at those issues uh, in terms of ethnography, in terms of discourse analysis is another domain. Though most of the research in this domain are not explicitly link, uh, linked to cognition, but uh, some of them do link to cognitive processes. One of them, uh, some important names in this regard are Wiesbichka and Goddard. But largely on, a, on, a, on the whole, the processes that do link intercultural communication to cognitive processes, they are more or less largely related to linguistic relativity. Of course, there are others also but largely. So, we, we already have seen Berlin and case uh, cross cultural studies on color perception uh, and then similarities in plant and animal classification across the world's languages, cognitive consequences of linguistic difference in spatial location. Similar studies have also looked at differences between Indo-European and Australian Aboriginal language in terms of frames of reference as in how you locate objects in space whether it is relative versus absolutive and so on. And then of course, speech acts for apologies using similar semantic strategies. So, there have been different you know branches of studies that have tried to that have tried to uh, merge the cognitive uh, aspect of language understanding as well as the intercultural communication. And an important name in this domain is Wiesbichka who has explored the relation between thought patterns and intercultural pragmatics. So, there are lots of interesting domains that are uh, looking at these issues uh, taking the language cognition connection interface in bilinguals on the one hand and then there are this application uh, oriented research. So, cultural attitudes condition people which in turn make them constantly aware of others right. So, uh, and this leads to objectivism being regarded as an important social value that is what her theory is on. 
Now, this is visible in second language conversation most when the speakers are still under the influence of L1 cultural uh, schemata. The idea of schemata resulting in behavior has also been explored. This is a very interesting domain and the schemata that your language provides underlying schemata and which in turn affects the way linguistic behavior uh, turns out to be in a conversation setup. So, this has been studied uh, this has been studied be before as well, but today we have more of uh, empirical studies that are taking place. And last but not the least, we are looking at bilingual consumer. In today's world, um, consumerism as you all know that is a very important uh, uh, rather all pervasive phenomenon. So, a lot of research is going on in this domain as well. So, in bilingual consumers response to the advertisements is has become has come out as a one apply, applied area of bilingualism studies. So, in the, the studies in this area often take revised hierarchical model. We talked about revised hierarchical model when we uh, looked at how the language, the lexical entities of each of the languages of a bilingual connects to the conceptual storage. So, that is what revised hierarchical model is. So, at the starting point to argue that L1 has stronger link to concepts that is what the basic idea of studies, many studies that have looked at uh, uh, the consumers response to advertisements have taken care of. This will lead to, so if you have a greater connection between the text and the concept in L1, but not such a strong connection between the text and the meaning in L2, what will auto automatically the, uh, the result of this will be that you will remember the memory of, of it will be stronger when L1 is used that is the idea. So, they found that a strong correlation between picture and ad text this there might be a high memory of the ads claims if the connection is strong, but if the correlation is weak memory of the claim is less. So, if you are using L1 versus L2 the differences will be visible in terms of what which wow, well, how much of the advertisement you actually remember. This is true even with fluent bilingual. So, interesting studies in this sometimes what they have done is sometimes they show that pictures make up for the L2 weaker L2 conceptual link. So, whether you are using pictures or not versus um, uh, whether it is L1 or L2 this kind of uh, these are these variables combined together show us that L1 is more um, useful to remember the ads the concepts of the ads, but if we use pictures then the compromising factor of L2 is not is taken care of that is one domain. Another domain is the use of code switching uh, in advertisements which is this is very common in India we you just open, uh, you know, switch on your TV and you see there are lots and lots of code switched um, speech that that uh, that are used in advertisements. So, they are used because they want to replicate real life experience. Now, it is not anymore confined to the bigger cities even in smaller places smaller towns we see a lot of code switching practice. So, advertisements uh, TVCs are basically trying to replicate the real life experience of the consumers and thereby create a connect right. So, this in turn is expected to capture the audience attention easily and help them uh, remember the uh, product. Some examples uh, life ke saath bhi life ke baad bhi uh, so, in the Indian uh, both in the uh, print and the audio visual media use this uh, strategy to a very large extent and I would say to, to a very uh, successful goal as well. So, be often you remember uh, another another domain of study could be the Amul um, the brand Amul and its advertisement strategies they also use a lot of code switched uh, uh, language and uh, Amul advertisements are of course, very popular and very very topical. The studies that looked at uh, that are looking at co code switching in the in advertisements have looked at uh, a few few ma major questions. Uh, two of them we will discuss here we will uh, look at here. The linguistic structural constraints on code switching in the code switch slogans because in the advertisements the slogan advertisements are typically like 20 seconds or 30 seconds long. So, within that you have to create a very effective slogan which will stay with the consumer and will effectively convey the message also. So, this is a very there are lots of constraints here. So, within that also the researchers have looked at the linguistic structural constraints. 
that are taken care of in these slogans as well as the sociolinguistic implications of code switching on the consumer's response. So, how far they have been useful, what are the strategies that are more useful for the product for the companies in terms of the consumers actually acting upon them, memorizing them more or buying more or you know how the consumer behavior gets affected as well as the various kinds of constraints while creating the slogan. So, these are the primary things. So, in a nutshell we have looked at um, the current research both in terms of uh, basic uh, basic research as well as applied research on bilingualism and with that we have come to the end of the course. I hope you have, I have been able to uh, tell you something new and of course uh, the idea is that you would have taken you would take home some new ideas, new inspiration to look at bilingualism as an interesting phenomena. We looked we started the course with justifying as to why we should study bilingualism and uh, keeping that in mind I hope. I have given you enough um, uh, reasons to look at bilingualism as an interesting area of research. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.